Earlier today, it was announced that President Trump had narrowed his list of candidates to fill the recently vacated Supreme Court seat to two women, Amy Coney Barrett on the left and Barbara Lagoa on the right. Now, Barbara Lagoa was in my top five list when he put out his list of 20, basically because of her connection to Florida, and of course, that's very important with the upcoming election. However, this seat is a lifetime appointment, so other considerations have to be made other than the temporal ones. It does give us, though, an opportunity to do a thought experiment about something that I was talking about nearly four years ago regarding Mr. Trump and our form of government, and in the process we're going to be able to defeat some liberal nonsense that has been floating around for quite some time about the Electoral College. Now, I know that seems like a lot to unpack in one video, but we're going to try to do it. Liberals believe that the Supreme Court should always have four liberal-leaning justices, four conservative, and one middle of the road. See, they believe they're entitled to certain seats. That's why they keep referring to it as the, the Ginsburg legacy seat or all this other stuff. No such thing is constitutional. No such thing is written down anywhere. It's just an assumption. Now, this is the picture that I want people to soak in for a little bit. Because it shows something. The man on the left and the man on the right are, of course, the same man. We have Donald and his wife, Ivana, on the left from way back in the late 1970s. And we have Donald and his daughter, Ivanka, on the right, recently. Now, the man on the left was a liberal. He was a Democrat. He was for years. But what happened? People change. People change. Sometimes temporarily, sometimes permanently, sometimes just as a result of age and experience. Now, if that's the case, when you nominate someone to the Supreme Court, you better make sure that they are what you think they are if you're doing it for political reasons. How can we be sure that anyone on the Supreme Court continues to believe the way they believe now. We have seen this with Gorsuch. We have seen this with Roberts, both appointed by conservative presidents, yet we have seen over and over again them side with liberals on different issues. So that kind of blows up the whole liberal narrative of we need to have parity. But... Let me ask you another question. There's a deeper thought experiment to be done here. Many people believe the Electoral College is fatally flawed, needs to be replaced, because of all sorts of different considerations with smaller states getting more representation and all this convoluted nonsense. Do we elect a king? Do we elect a pharaoh? We of course do not. Does the President of the United States have the ability to write law? No. Does the President of the United States have the ability to rule on legal matters? Absolutely not. You see, those are two hallmarks of a king. And we don't have kings. Funny how the liberals were not complaining about the Electoral College from 2008 to 2016. Well, I should say probably from 2004 to 2012. They complained about it a great deal in 2016. It makes me think of this, the Holy Roman Empire. Napoleon came in and swept away the last vestiges of this in the 1800s. But freedom is messy. People wouldn't necessarily equate the 1500s in Europe with freedom, but it was the Renaissance. Art philosophy, literature, so many things exploded during this time. And look how governance was done. Kingdoms, principalities, lordships, pal palatinates, archduchies, landgraviats, never even heard of that. 
all of the different lower levels of government, all of the tiny levels of government. Freedom is messy. In free societies, people fall through the cracks, drink too much, eat too much, buy unaffordable homes, fail to make prudent provision for health care, and much else but the price of being relieved of all of those tiresome choices by a benign paternal government is far too high. Big government is the small option. It's the guarantee of smaller freedom, smaller homes, smaller cars, smaller opportunities, and smaller lives. This is where the liberals will short-circuit when you read stuff like this, because they really believe that all goodness and light comes from somebody sitting in a seat in Washington, D.C. How can that possibly be in a free society? You see, this goes back to what I was talking about. The reason Donald Trump went from being a liberal and a Democrat to a conservative is because he grew up. He maybe grew up a little bit late in life, but he grew up. Conservative concepts believe in little government. Take care of yourself. And that makes men who invent things like the Constitution. Liberal thought has big government. We'll take care of you. And that creates boys. And they create things like Antifa, BLM, and Occupy Wall Street. There's a difference between the way men and boys behave. That's what this is really about. Many people would call into question this quote from Voltaire. He was a French writer and philosopher. The Holy Roman Empire is neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Well, he lived in the late 1600s, and he could probably speak on this quite well. Because the truth was that as much power as the church would have liked you to believe that they had, they didn't have that much power. They truthfully didn't. Pardon the camera noise. You see, history has rewritten this about how powerful the Holy Roman Empire was. And it was for its day. Even today, if it were to reunite, its largest city would have been Berlin, a population of 192 million, GDP a little less than 8 trillion, third largest economy in the world, seventh largest military force in the world, if it were to reunite today. So it was big, don't get me wrong, but this was the Roman Empire. And its largest city would have 14 million people. Third most populous country at 716 million people. GDP would be 15 trillion, meaning second only to the United States. 3.9 million active personnel, largest military force by far. You see, today's video was going to be about this one article about how this guy Ryan Cooper throws a temper tantrum. He's a liberal writer saying that America is the Holy Roman Empire of the 21st century and complaining about how the Electoral College is too messy and we need to have more of a top-down authoritarian style of election, meaning mob rule. But this thing with the Supreme Court is a perfect um, dovetail to it because it assumes something. It assumes that the president is so powerful. In our system of government, he's not. He cannot write law, and he cannot rule on legal matters. Imagine trying to tell that to Pharaoh. Imagine trying to tell that to King George or King Louis. You are in charge, but you can't write law, and you can't rule on legal matters. They would have said, well, what's the point of being in charge? But that's our form of government. I just wanted to read this for you guys, just to cover what this... Uh, writer, as a liberal writer, was saying and not even understanding the contradiction in his own article. Germany is today a first-ranked power, rich, strong, and efficiently governed. But just over 200 years ago, most of its current territory was a shambolic free mess, part of the Holy Roman Empire, which even at the time was recognized as an anachronistic political fossil. More than a thousand years old at that point, the empire was a patchwork of hundreds of different duchies, electorates, principalities, kingdoms, church lands, and so forth, some of them just a few dozen acres. Liechtenstein is one of these relics which still survives, with an exceptionally complicated and illogical tangle of legal institutions 
overlaying them all, surpassed by history, the Confederation was ripe for the picking by an opportunistic tyrant. This is his foreshadowing of Napoleon. The United States today bears an uncomfortable similarity to that doomed empire. The American Constitution is the oldest in the world still operating and has been obviously out of date for well over a century. Yeah, all that pesky freedom of speech, freedom of the press, gun rights, all that well out of date. Whatever. Half the basic me mechanics of government are either malfunctioning kludges or a gross betrayal of its own founding principles. Countries that fail to maintain themselves to this degree often do not survive. And of course, he gets to his point here. Let's start with the Electoral College, which has, which has developed a clear bias towards Republicans. I guess only in uh, when Republicans are in power. Not when uh, Barack Obama won the presidency two times in a row. A two to three point Biden popular vote would mean a toss up, according to its rules, while he would need about a five point victory to be sure. As I have argued before in detail, this is the goofiest method of selecting a head of government found in any rich nation and quite possibly in the entire world. The President of the United States is an administrator of the executive branch of our government. He is an administrator of the executive branch of our government. Once again, no power to rule on legal matters and no power to write law. Not only has it delivered the presidency to the popular vote loser twice in less than two decades, it is mechanically possible to win while losing the popular vote four to one. Moreover, its winner-take-all structure means that presidential candidates pay rapt attention to only a handful of states with a close partisan balance. Now, this is true. However, we don't elect based on mob rule. You see, here's what he's afraid of. He's afraid of the Constitution being invoked here. While these people have talked for a long time about our system of government being the best in the world and how people should be like us, when it doesn't suit their political needs, they've got no problem tearing it down. A president has no obligation to serve the states that didn't vote for him. That's because the president doesn't have that level of power. Doesn't have that level of power. You see, Florida has 22 million people. Liberal and conservative. 22 million people. Liberal and conservative. California, 40 million people, mostly liberal. Texas, 37 million people, mostly conservative. But we have a mix here. As Michael Kazin writes at The Nation, the Electoral College was obviously a clunky mess from the moment its current form took effect, which is why it has near, nearly been abolished several times, but it hasn't, has it? None of the defenses of the system by conservatives who like it because they perceive a momentary partisan advantage would stand a moment's scrutiny. Worse still, the Electoral College does not even legally enforce, legally, remember that term, enforce the rules I outlined above. For instance, it is legal for state legislatures to simply ignore the results of the vote in November and send a slate of electors, pardon me, sorry about that, to simply ignore the results of the vote in November. Now, this is critical for people to understand. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say that a state, A, must conduct an election, B, must use the results of those elections to send electors, or C, send electors at all. There's nowhere in the Constitution that requires a state to even participate. But it does say, if you participate, if you participate, here are the rules. Send your electors by this date and make sure those electors are chosen by your state legislature. Now, how are legislatures determined? Legislatures are determined by the will of the people. Mob rule. So the people that are choosing the electors, meaning your state government, were chosen by your people. If they do it wrong, replace them. But of course, this is all a state's rights argument, isn't it? And they can't have this. You see, for them, controlling a state's not, not enough. Controlling California is not enough. Controlling New York is not enough. Controlling Illinois from one city is not enough. They need to control everybody. 
all the time. See, they forget that Clinton won two terms. Obama won two terms with this system. Oops. Oops. I wonder if they want to overturn those. And this guy goes on and blah, blah, blah about gerrymandering and about how it's all the fault of Republicans, all the fault of conservatives. While totally ignoring that currently the U.S. House of Representatives is controlled by Democrats. Prior to the death of Miss Ginsburg, the Supreme Court was controlled by Democrats. 16 years of Democrat presidents. But because for the first time, in a lot of their adult lives, they are seeing themselves on the minority end of things, they can't handle it. And they can't handle this. They can't handle this. You see, this is what they're terrified of, and this is what it boils down to. The reason I use this picture, and I created it specifically, people change. I'm going to say something that's going to blow your mind. The 18-year-olds that are voting for the first time in 2020 were barely out of junior high or in junior high when this man took office. Now, I know that doesn't seem like a huge statement, but think about that for a minute. Who would have considered the opinions of a 15-year-old back in 2015? Well, guess what? Those opinions count for a vote right now. Who you are when you're 15 versus who you are when you're 18, 19, 20 years old. Very different thing, isn't it? And as you progress and you get older, now the man on the left, if I've done my math right, was an ad- 30 here, maybe in his, in his 30s. I don't know the man's exact birthday, but I know he's in his 70s now, so I'm just trying to do it in my head as I go backward. But I'm just going to say in his 30s in this picture, and he was, that would qualify in anybody's mind, I believe, to be a full-grown adult. Would it not? So even in our adult lives, we change. We see things differently. We grow and become different. Now our government is populated by men and women, mankind, I guess I should say, who have the ability over time to change, to morph, and to become somebody very different. But think about that in this context. When you appoint somebody to the Supreme Court, there's no re-electing them in eight years. There's no changing your mind. They're there for life. And these two women, relatively speaking, are fairly young individuals. Not as young as Ginsburg was when she first came to office. But it completely defeats the argument that we have some type of a government that the president is so powerful that it makes such a difference in everyday life of the average American. Our quote-unquote president cannot write law and cannot rule on legal matters. Imagine telling that to any historical leader going back to Caesar. You have no power to speak to legal matters, leader of whatever empire, and you have no power to make law. I think Pharaoh, I think Caesar, I think Napoleon, I think King George would have all sat around at a table hearing that and gone, what the hell kind of government is that? And why would the people living under it believe that they were in some type of tyranny? These are things that people don't really think about. But anyway, I guess I will leave it there. I believe either one of these two women would make a fine choice to the Supreme Court given their past, given their history. But, once again, what do we know about people? People change. Like, share, subscribe.